today we're just going to do um, a little interview with Malcolm Duncan. Malcolm, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you back for the second time, uh, twice in, t- in two years yeah, uh, along you. with us and uh, really enjoyed your ministry last night as we did last year during the Bible studies. Um, and you're a very busy man, um, involved in many, many different things and I would just be interested in some of the things that you are involved in outside of your preaching, um, things like church and community and spring harvest. Um, would you like to tell us just a little bit about some of those other roles? Spring Harvest is a, um, a festival that happens every year, but it's actually a movement. It, lead, it touches about 45,000, 50,000 people over a four or five week period. Then the teaching and the stuff that happens in it is probably one of the um, biggest resources to the church in Europe reaching into the hundreds of thousands of people and I chair that, I, I chair that event and the planning of it and so forth. And next year, 2014, we're looking at the theme of confidence in God under the title of Unbelievable. Do we believe the gospel and does, do we believe that God can use it to transform us and do we still have confidence that God believes in us? It's going to be a very powerful time. So that involves a lot of writing, a lot of planning, speaking, a whole range of stuff around um, the United Kingdom and, and Europe. And then Church and Community is a charity that helps churches to think through what it means to be good news people, how the gospel translates itself into the way we behave and interact with society, and then helps those churches to get involved with society and involved with community. And it has four key principles. The first is that every local church in the world is called to be engaged as being the presence of Jesus, helping people on the ground, meeting need where you find it. The second is that We are all called as people of God to be prophetic, standing up against injustice and for the marginalised. The third is that we are called to be people who proclaim and preach the word of God, not ashamed to explain with words who Jesus is. And the fourth is that we are called to be a people of prayer. That works with about um, six or seven hundred churches in the UK and about another seven or eight hundred churches around the world and it works in 22 countries. Mm. And then I lead a local church and I'm involved with the United Nations and the European Union in advocacy and defending the rights of the marginalised and arguing that the gospel and Christian faith has a powerful positive contribution to make to healthy society. Yeah, wow, so you have a lot on your plate. Uh, Well, I'm not, I mean, people say that to me all the time. I don't feel busy, I feel mm. very focused. Yeah. And uh, before anything else, I'm a, a pastor, I'm a man who believes God's called me to lead a local church yeah. into the purposes of God, and it's an honour. That my life is divided into sections that hold together around who Jesus is and what he would have me to do. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And do you then have a, a way of edging out things that obviously you could get invitations to go here, to do this, to be involved in this? Do you have a structure that helps you to order what's most important within your life then? Yeah, I do. I have an accountability group that helps me with that and I once a week look at um, invitations. I get about 70, 80, sometimes 90 invitations a week. Yeah. Um, and obviously the vast majority of those I can I say no to. Um, but I pray about that. I have a group of people that help me think about that. I am um, very specific about making sure that my local church is not neglected. And then there are some filters. Does this uh, further the gospel? Does it help people to understand that they can be a power and a source for good. Is it biblical? Mm. Is this a good thing that's going to uplift Jesus or not? And of all those filters, um, if, if, if an invitation passes through those filters and I sense it's right, then, then I'll say yes. Yeah, Great. So on top of all of that, you've just written a book called Risk Takers. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Risk Takers is about inviting people to think about who Jesus is and the claims that he makes in our lives. And it it basically is built around the life of one person in the New Testament called Epaphroditus. Mm. And his name means the risker or the risk taker. And it explores who he is. And then it says, um, are we willing to take a risk for the gospel? He's described by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 as someone who risked everything for the gospel. Mm. It's a word that doesn't appear very often in the New Testament. And um, he took a monetary gift to the people from the people of Philippi to Paul when he was in jail and in bringing the gift he had to make himself a prisoner too because Paul needed him mm-hmm. and uh, in 252 in Carthage there was a an outbreak of the plague and they threw the dead out and the dying outside the city walls because they were anxious that they were going to end up infected and the bishop of Carthage uh, was a man called Cyprian and he gathered the church together and he said to them would you leave the city of Carthage to care for the sick and the dying and the excluded. 
would you be risk takers? And he uses the same word that describes Epaphroditus. And the church left Carthage to care for the sick. And a movement began in the wider church in the world that lasted through until the 10th century. And they were called in English, the risk takers. But it petered out. And it strikes me that we should still be called the risk takers. We should be the people that are taking risks, risking everything for Christ. Not risking Christ, but risking ourselves for him. Mm. And it explores what that might look like and how we could respond to that. Brilliant, and so we're we're hoping that that book will be available um, here at Bible Week. If not, all good reputable bookshops should have it. <laughs> um, so that's that little plug there, but I'm sure it'll be a really great r- read. One of the questions <clears throat> Malcolm I had for you, and I know um, having heard you preach that you are a believer in everything the Bible says, um, even in regards of healing. Mm-hmm. And yet, what we find in the world today is children born with illness, disease, you have your own experience of that, um, and people getting sick, and I find as a Pentecostal church we have to live in a tension of some sorts between believing for healing, um, but maybe not seeing as much as we'd want to. Um, would you have anything you would like to speak into that, how you would help? I think there are, I, 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 I mean I live with this on a daily basis in my own family, um, I think that's right, and I think that there are, there, for me as a pastor there are two challenges at, at either end of an extreme that we need to be careful about. One is because we are disillusioned and disappointed with God, we give up believing that he heals. Mm. And the other is that we say that he always heals, and therefore if something, if someone isn't healed, they're doing something wrong. And on one side, we hear people say things like, I will not let my experience reduce my theology, mm. which sounds great, but it's actually quite difficult. And on the other side, uh, we hear people saying, well, God clearly doesn't do this now because there are very few people healed. I want to live in the dynamic tension of believing that God is able to do anything and all things. And I want to walk with people believing that God can instantaneously restore them. I believe that the miraculous gift of healing is still available and exercised in the church. Um, However seldom we may or may not see that, it is still present. So I will always pray for healing. If a family, however, says to me, I believe that it's time that we started praying differently about this, then I'll listen to them very carefully. And I also think that God heals, although not miraculously. He heals through medicine. He heals through care. And I think I want to have a conversation about what healing and health looks like, Mm. not just what healing is. And often, you know, Alistair, people say, "Um, what is your theology of healing? I want to reverse that. And this is a really controversial thing. I've got into trouble for what I'm about to say. I want to say, what's your theology of sickness? Okay. Because without a theology of sickness, you can't pastor to people. You can't minister to them. You can't help them through difficult times. I believe in God even when he is silent. I believe that he heals even when I don't see it. I believe that he's good even when I don't feel it. Mm. And I want to be able to say to people, whether you are well or ill, God will work with you. Mm. The story of Lazarus is a really interesting one for me. Jesus delays going and lets his friend die. Mm. And when he gets there, the whole story is pregnant with disappointment because Mary and Martha both say to him, if you'd only come a few days earlier, this wouldn't have happened. And then there's this little sentence where they say, but we still know you can do something. Um, And of course we know that he raises him from the dead. The people that were there didn't know he was going to do that. But the thing that really strikes me about that story is Jesus stands at the uh, mouth of the tomb and he weeps. Why did he cry if he knew he was going to raise him from the dead? Why did he not say to Mary and Martha, don't worry about this, it'll all be fine in a couple of minutes. Mm. Instead, he fully entered into their grief. And then he healed or raised Lazarus from the dead. So I want to have a conversation about believing that God heals, but that he doesn't always. And it's in his sovereign purpose and will. He can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. But whether he physically heals now or not, he is good and his love endures forever. And the second thing that I want to say is, I do believe that all Christians are fundamentally and finally healed forever at the point when they see Christ or he returns. All other healings are temporary. Mm-hmm. All other healings are temporary. Yeah. Even Lazarus' healing was temporary. Yeah. So I want to have a conversation about a bigger discussion around healing than just does God do miracles? Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. Oh, I think that's great and very helpful. 
Um, Malcolm, just on to what you're speaking on over the, the, the couple of days that you're with us. Obviously, you're, you, we had you last night and you're on tonight. Um, and then another time during the week on Thursday evening. Thursday evening and we're really looking forward to tonight and Thursday um, would you like just to give us a bit of a promo about what you're going to be saying <laughs> on those days and the whole, all of this week I've been exploring the, the idea of the God whom we encounter the God mm. who encounters us so last night I looked at the God who encounters us through his voice yeah. uh, tonight I want to look at the God who encounters us through the pain of the world mm. and I want to look at the, uh, what the gospel actually is is the gospel Repent so that when you die, you go to heaven? Mm. Or is the gospel that Jesus is Lord and everything is changed by that? Yeah. And that we are called to be his ambassadors. I want to explore how the good news of Jesus serves the poor, changes the excluded, welcomes the forgotten, mm. calls us to be active salt and light in society, bringing transformation wherever we go and whatever we do. I believe tonight is going to be a very powerful evening as the Holy Spirit touches and releases people into areas of ministry and service yeah. across the Northern Ireland and on Thursday night funnily enough I want to look at the question of God the God who encounters us in healing and restoration Brilliant. and I want to pray for the sick yeah. I want to lift up those who are physically spiritually or emotionally sick or in desperate need I also want to pray for those who stand on behalf of those who need a touch yes. of the Lord and I also believe that Thursday night is going to be a really powerful mm. powerful time as God moves in deep, deeply in people's lives. On Friday at 2, I'm doing a leadership seminar yeah. and I'm going to be exploring what it means to lead for the long haul and remain faithful to Jesus. That's super. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, oh, that's super. So, um, you've heard lots of what uh, Malcolm's going to be saying and I would very much recommend that you do a number of things. Um, one, share this on your Facebook page or on your Twitter feed and um, get the word out about Elam Bible Week Ireland. Um, great things are happening here. Tonight we've got Lara Martin, Martin leading some worship for us and, um, and then Malcolm will be speaking and that's at half past seven. So I want to encourage you, get down, get involved, be part of something great. Thank you. Thank you.